too long, didn't read version of my talk. Um, if you're doing a lot of text-based serialized object passing, JSON, namely, and you're looking at ways to improve the performance, you know, if, 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 it's, if it's getting a little slow on you, um, you know, try some binary formats. Um, so the, the thing is, is that when you represent things with text, um, you know, each, you know, each, each like character is at least a byte, and um, with UTF, it's you know it can be more, and um, it's not. Um, it, you know, when you when you get into the binary realm, you can start doing things like this. We can represent this entity with a bit, which you know, it sounds like a you know not that big of a deal, but like when you start dealing with like a lot of data, you know, those those things kind of add up. Um, CPUs can usually process binary uh, formats faster. As a consequence, there's just less stuff to do. Um, and, and here's the, the kicker for me. Like, if you do it correctly, and this, I think this is what I, I'm trying to show you guys how, how you can do this correctly. Um, if you do it correctly, um, they actually can be pretty easy to implement. There's a lot of kind of tools out there to help you do this. Um, uh, some reasons not to. Um, you know, if you write, so the, the first two are mainly for custom binary protocol, like formats, which I'll get into. Um, if you write your own binary format to represent your problem domain, um, you, you, there's, you're going to have to write the implementation of that in every language. I mean, the, the, the developers can, but like it's really tough to like take a you know, RESTful API person and, and have them you know, have to deserialize binary data. You know, it's just not something that's in their comfort zone. Um, it's really hard to under, and, and, and even doing that, you need to have some pretty good documentation to describe to people this problem. Um, which is a you know I've for the binary formats I've run into are like very poorly or just not documented well at all. Um, they're they're really they're they're hard to debug low level if something bad happens. So for example, if you have to actually go into the file and look at the you know, information, um, you know if there's if there's any kind of like corruption issues or anything like that. Um, and and it, binary isn't intrinsically mean performance. You have to measure this stuff. I mean it, it could just be the implementation of the um, the serializer in your language happens to be faster. You know, it's better optimized. Um, so the two general approaches you can take with this are um, you can do a custom handled format, as in you can make your own binary kind of format, um, or you can use, there's a lot of kind of frameworks that you can use to help you build these, um, namely protocol buffers. Uh, message pack is, is one that's thrown out around. Uh, I, I do have some examples later. Uh, BERT is one that I recently just kind of saw in passing, which is really similar to message pack. I think it tries to fix a few of the problems in message pack. Um, I can get into that. Um, so I want to talk about custom binary formats quickly because um, you know this kind of goes kind of nicely into Nuno's kind of end talk about node proxy, which is or uh, HTTP proxy, which is that um, you know it, yes you might have to run four you know you're switching from JSON to a binary format you might have to run you know you know four servers instead of three and I, I think that you know there's we have this kind of problem with premature optimization in the industry. Um, I, I do actually see it a lot a lot. And it, it kind of like tears me up when I have to when I'm either watching companies struggle as a consequence of it, or when I'm personally have to do something crazy as a consequence of it. Um, and so, you, if you're going to make one, you have to. I mean, I'm not saying that it's a bad idea to make one, but you really have to think about like, does this make sense? Like, should I do this? Like, it's a very serious question. It's like, I don't know, getting married, right? It's like something you have to consider doing. It's not just like a casual thing. Um, the um, well, okay. Unless you, unless you go to Las Vegas and you know Elvis marriage or whatever, um, so I want to show you a really bad custom binary format, and it's a part of the Apple push notification service. And this thing ruined my life for like two weeks straight because I had to actually we were having problems with our interface, and I had to basically implement this um, as a new kind of library uh, as a consequence um, because our old one was dropping packets or, or dropping messages arbitrarily, and if you know that's like your bread and butter, which it was with Geoloki. Uh, that's not good. Um, I think it's a textbook case of premature optimization and its pitfalls. I don't think it was a very well thought out implementation, so I'm going to show it to you. So uh, I want you to consider um, th this whole thing is a single line. I broke it up so that you can I could you know zoom it in and show you guys it. Um, but it starts with the the command uh, byte, which is just basically like um, that's the protocol version. And so this is if you see binary protocols this is kind of a convention you'll see where they throw the version uh, like they'll throw like a byte on the front so you can like if this if it was zero it would be the first version of the protocol if it was one it'd be the first uh, you know the second you, you know what I mean like um, token length is I don't uh, it's this arbitrary thing that doesn't really make a lot of sense um, it's supposed to be for um, it's supposed to be for like this I, I, I don't even get into it 
Uh, the device token uh, is the actual like token that you get from the iPhone that like represents the thing that you're sending it to. It's the it's the unique identifier of the device. Um, so you, it keeps going this way, but I'll, just on the bottom here, um, the, the the payload length, which is the size of um, the the last component, uh, which is uh, a, a adjacent that's been like a duct taped to the end of this, and so like it's this like weird hybrid of like a binary format, and you know a, a JSON, and you know it's just like why what like what what is going on here like what. Why are we like switching between the two? I mean, it's just it's so weird to me. Like, what it what's the and it, it really is like kind of like the pro, you know this is you know people get out of some computer science and they they don't think like let's build things in terms of architecture, right? Let's they, they think of things and in, in like let's see how much performance we can you know break out of this thing. And you know I think you get weird kind of I, I don't know if it's the fact that like this doesn't actually give you a lot more performance it, that bothers me. I don't know if that's a, or if it's just so like like, you know, mentally inconsistent that, like, it's switching between the two. It's just, like, so fuzzy. Um, you know, oh, here's another problem with the APNAS protocol. I mean, that, that doesn't really describe it in that. But if you if you send a successful, if you send, like, a message successfully, you just get no response at all. So it doesn't even send you a confirmation bit. Um, so you just have to assume that it worked. It, it, if there's an error, it will disconnect the socket at an arbitrary point in the future as in like between zero and like one second. And, and, and in the interim, if you send any messages through that system, it will drop them. And so that's that, you know, in the, in the, so basically as a consequence, this is kind of advanced socket stuff, but what you have to do basically is run an, I, I'm the, by the way, I'm the only person that's ever fixed this. So if you're running an APNS protocol right now, I'll, I'll, show, you the, I'll show you the code that fixed it. Um, but I basically run an io.select on, um, I, I run an io.select on, that socket and wait for something to come back in the period of a second, and I don't send anything through that until I get through that one second. And so, as a consequence of them trying to like super performance optimize this protocol, they've made something where you have to basically put a socket to sleep for a second in order to actually not lose data. And I've confirmed with a very large, not to be named, um, push message company that just actually just professionally serves push notifications to these phones as an abstraction layer. Um, that they actually didn't, they don't, they don't fix this either, and so like they're just, they, they're just like, well, sometimes you know, it's just not. Sometimes you lose messages, you know. It's just like, oh, great, and that's, you know, that's great. <laughs> um, so like, here's, you know, look at this. Like, th this isn't. We could have actually just, they could have just used the entire thing as JSON, right? Like, here's your, here's your version, here's your device token, and here's your alert. Or you could, you know, do an array one, which is slightly smaller, right? Like, I mean, both of these are, I think, better solutions, and um, you know, but the, it's so funny. They're so like freaked out about performance like they even like here's the examples that show the JSON and and every single one of them has a warning on the bottom that you should remove the white space and new line characters to to you know for better performance you know it's just like it it, it, it that's not how you speed up infrastructure you know it's just weird and, you know so this is like I don't know this is like I feel like this is the guy that wrote the thing and like this is him in, in the command center or whatever and and so meanwhile meanwhile over at Google, like they're just using a JSON API to send these messages, and so there's your. You can actually send them with curl. Like you know, this is a much easier solution to this problem. You know, um, and yeah, like it's it's fast enough. That's you know, I guess that's this is my like kind of that's just me scaring you about binary for formats. Don't like seriously consider them. You know, don't just like kind of half-ass them like that. You'll get bad results. Um, so let's look at some binary uh, formats. Uh, and some tools for making them, because um, this kind of gives you a nice framework for building on top of it. It's a lot easier to use. There's more language support. So the one that Google uses is protocol buffers, and um, they have like every all of their like RPC is basically uses this. And I, I think I read somewhere that there's like they have like 12,000 uh, like services that are based on this or something like that. It's just a ton, a ton of work. It's basically they all of their stuff goes through this. Um, it's a it's very fast. It's a it, the one thing that's kind of weird about protocol buffers is that you have to actually define. Um, you, it has a schema of sorts. Like you have to define a, a, a dot proto file, and um, this is what it looks like. It, it's kind of like you know making like a you know like a, a SQL database or something like that, right? Like where you have to like say like okay, here's this you know here's the string that's the, represents the name. Um, so if this was a person, then like they have kind of like nested stuff like the phone number. Um, and you can have, I think, I think, I think this one gives you the context of having multiple phone numbers. 
um, but I'm not exactly sure. I'm not like a huge expert on this. Um, but what you do is you can take this, I mean this part of it is kind of cool, you can take this proto file and you can actually plug it, in. there's a program you can, there's a kind of, kind of a command line thing you can run that will convert that into a library version uh, on, your lang on your language that you're using. And so like if you run that in C++, you get this and it like, gives you like a nice class to represent that. And so like, um, you know, if you have like, if you have to interface with something at Google, like you just have to get their proto file and run the command in whatever language you're using and it'll just like build this kind of object, this kind of class for you, which is, um, which is pretty nice actually. I mean, that, that part of it is kind of nice. Um, I, to me, it's a little overkill. Uh, I come from the JSON world. I, I, I do, you know, I'm not partisan about schema lists, but I, I do feel like it's, I'm more comfortable with schema lists uh, message passing um, just because, you know, I, I, they do kind of, I, I, I often don't know what needs to go through, so I need to like continuously add new things. And I, I, I just like the idea of a, a schema list format. Um, so there's actually a lot of stuff for doing that. Um, so just quickly to go through JSON, I mean, I'm sure everybody knows this, but like, um, you know, you can do things like there's numbers, so you integers and floats, um, you know, basic strings, Boolean, true or false, array, um, and I, objects are just kind of like nested, <coughs> JSON, and uh, null, just nil, ob, you know, object, and this is actually really great for me. I've never like, I've never had a problem I couldn't solve with these things. Like, it's pretty much all, it's pretty much perfect for everything I do. Um, and so what I tried to do was like find, I wanted to look for something that was like this, except that it was, you know, by, by, it, used, it would take out, for example, the, the curly the curly braces and, or something like that, you know. And I stumbled across a few things, and the, the first one, that I, the message pack was the one I kind of really got in, interested in. Um, it essentially takes all of the same input as JSON. I think that's deliberate, too. Um, it, it's, just, it's just a little faster and a little smaller. And... Um, you know, it, it, if you use it, it, it's kind of like using JSON, right? Where you just do a JSON.parse, except that you just use the me message pack pack. It's it's like one line of code to actually switch a JSON object uh, over to this format. You know, and and that's the part that I think is really cool is just that it's it's so simple. You know, like because that's part of my thing is like you know if, if you're performance optimizing, like I. I, you know, I don't. I don't necessarily think that's a great idea. But if it's so simple that you can do it with a couple lines of code, then all of a sudden it becomes a really compelling option to me. Um, so I, I took this from Indie Gamer, um, uh, which is you know in the gaming industry they're notoriously bad at making custom binary formats. Just like everything is like image formats and everything. Um, but you, this kind of gives you an idea of like what um, of what you know. So you, with JSON on the left, you've got like the curly, and then you've got the string, which is represented by seven uh, B and seven uh, twenty two. This isn't the kind of the hex printout. Um, but with this, you can basically, so with 82 there, I think what it does is it defines the kind of the object. And then, uh, let's see, A4, yeah, so it's just smaller, right? Like it, it takes those like kind of commas and, you know, bra you know like uh, quotes and colons and it just like reduces them to kind of this nice structure and says like, well, we can just represent it like that. And yeah, if you print it out uh, with like a text editor or something, it, it looks weird, right? Because it's, you know, it's, I don't think it's trying to represent British pounds there, you know, but they, it, but it is it is a little bit smaller, and so um, it, it's just it's just it, it it that that's how it works. That's why it's smaller and and a little faster to, to work with. Um, now this is something I was I wanted to show you guys because this is like a really JavaScript heavy, really WebSockets heavy audience. Um, there's this project called Binary JS, which is um, basically message pack, except it's like kind of glued in with socket I uh, with WebSockets. Uh, and so, like, you can basically use it to send because WebSockets actually support binary, and so you can use this to send um, to, to basically send binary over WebSockets instead of JSON, which and, and it'll work ex pretty much exactly the same, right? I mean, it's, it's a similar idea. Um, and you know, I, I, haven't I haven't actually had a chance to use this, but like, I, I thought you know, this is basically what I was trying to do yesterday, but I ran into some problems with like uh, serializing my message pack, and then I had to go describe to a doctor who doesn't speak English that I, I need I need allergy medicine, so. Um, uh, the, 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 I guess the big takeaway I want to I want to kind of uh, throw at you guys is that it's actually really the thing is it's so simple to just support this stuff. I mean, like particularly with like message pack, you know, if you let's say you have a an API, right, a REST API, and you want to actually support binary format formatting on the input and output, this is really all you have to do. I mean, just basically you can you can either do like a query string parameter like that. Or uh, on, the, on the top, you can uh, set content type, 
to application you know X message pack, and then people can if you look at that, you can be like, okay, well, I'll, I'll, sure, I'll, I'll return message pack. Um, you know, accept. Um, it just plugs right in. It's so easy to do. I mean, we, we actually did this on the GLT platform. We never actually, I never actually released it, but um, you know, it, it, it took me like two hours to give us a binary output. And you know, if, if you're dumping a lot of data out in JSON, look, you've got like a couple megabytes worth of data you have to spit out. Like, that, this could make a big difference. You know. Um, okay. So uh, I wanted to show you some benchmarks because uh, I think it is again, it's really important that you kind of measure this stuff. Um, let's see. Oh, where'd it go? There it is. <laughs> Sorry, I have to just like throw all of my windows over there. Okay. Okay. Can everybody see, everybody see this okay? Um, okay, so this is just like a really quick Ruby thing I put together to just do some basic measurements. Um, because again, like you have to make sure that this that your native language implementation actually does this really well. Um, so with this one, I'm just testing. Um, see, this one's just CPU. Just how long it takes the CPU to actually process this. Um, so I've got the JSON kind of native built-in uh, gem um, and message pack, and I basically just 100,000 times I'm just packing this, and that's basically it. Uh, pretty, pretty, pretty simple. Probably too simple. Uh, and then I'm going to have it spit out uh, how, how much faster message pack is. So let's see, Ruby. So in this particular example, um, oh, come on, move. It's doing the sticky thing. The perils of live demos. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, it's it's literally um, with this with this benchmark, it's 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 362 percent faster. You know, like that's that's pretty damn good. Like if you're doing a lot of work. That's and, and you have to, you know, if you're running a lot of serialization, you know, that's that's a pretty good improvement. I mean, um, so this next one is uh, file size. Um, so this one's a little weirder, and I didn't dry this up very well. But um, basically, what I'm doing here is the same thing, except that I'm also writing it to the to a file. And then I'm getting the size of that file, and I'm I'm spitting that out, um, and, and to see how much larger um, JSON is compared to Beeson and Message Pack. I threw in Beeson for uh, Beeson is the uh, binary format that's used by MongoDB, and um, I want to show you something that's kind of an interesting property of uh, Beeson um, that not a lot of people. Well, maybe maybe it's well known. I don't know. Um, oh, it's complaining about performance. Don't worry about it. Um, so um, with this run, with this running example, JSON is 147 percent larger. Beeson is 135 percent, so it's almost as big as JSON. Um, and, you know, and, and and so they're both quite a bit larger than um, than Message Pack. Um, the, the thing I think is important to note is that Beeson here is not Beeson is used on a date. It's kind of designed for database work, and so it's not really used for um, it's not really used for like kind of serialization for like work queues and message passing and stuff. Um, what it does is uh, Beeson actually pads um, with a bunch of zeros the data that, that's going in, um, and and the reason it does that is to be more traversable uh, for doing like uh, query lookups and things like that. Um, and there's a reason why like putting it in the right order it makes it easier for you to seek files and stuff. Um, there's a lot better guides out there than I could possibly just you know give you. Um, this third one is something I wanted to show you too because I've been talking about Beanstalk and I had this idea of like okay what if I wanted to switch our Beanstalk stuff over to uh, Message Pack. Um, so I I just want to show how easy it is to actually do this. I mean again just the fact that it's so simple. I mean this is what makes it so compelling to me. So here I basically just um, you know the idea with Bean you know Beanstalk is that you just basically put a message on 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 the queue, and then um, 
you just basically listen for stuff to work to come through on the other end. And um, so, you know, basically what I did was the, you know, the, the typical method is put, and I just made a put, you know, underscore message pack, and it just does the exact same thing, except it converts it to message pack, and then it, you know, can, you know, unpacks it when you listen. And so, yeah, I mean, with um, 23 lines of, you know, the evil monkey patching, I mean, you can do, there's a Java, JavaScript equivalent to this, just adding another function to the prototype, right? Um, you, if you, you have, there's your binary format for, beast, uh, for a beanstalk uh, queue, work queue. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's how simple it can be. If you, if you, you know, it, it doesn't have to be like this kind of scary, like 1980s to 1990s binary format, like, thing where, like, it's, it's all these weird proprietary, like, you know, Microsoft Word documents and stuff that are crazy and scary and nobody wants to work with them. Like, you can use binary in, like, a health, happy, healthy way that um, has uh, support with multiple languages. So, um, you know, with, um, because there's tools for unserializing message pack and, you know, all these other kind of protocol buffers on every, pretty much every language. And so, like, you don't have to tell your developers, okay, you need to learn how to deal with binary formats. You can just tell them, just run this one line of code, and then you're 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 back in business. So, um, yeah, uh, that was the that was the goal. My goal of my talk. I, I hope that you guys will look at binary formats if you're ever running into any performance issues. Um, beware the perils of custom formats; uh, they can be very evil. And um, <clears throat> yeah, that's that's pretty much my talk. Thank you.